He has to be a fan of Jesus Christ and that you know a lot about him, but you do not have a personal relationship with him. For you see, Jesus wants all of us to be followers of Jesus Christ. We've taken as our text that we've used during this time, Luke's Gospel, the ninth chapter. Luke chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. Then he said to them, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. Are you willing to lose your life to save it? Lose your life to follow Jesus Christ? I want you to turn over in your Bibles to John's Gospel, the 8th chapter, the first 11 verses. I'll get there in a minute. Pastor told a story about when he was in high school. And uh, in the high school he was in, there was a young girl. Oh, she was a freshman or sophomore, not even a junior. And uh, she got pregnant. She was 15, 16 years of age. And he said we lived in a pretty small town. He said the church that we went to wasn't that big either. And so news of the pregnancy spread quickly. For a while she kept trying to come to church, even though she uh, started the show. But as she got bigger, some of the parents of the church, some of the parents of other teens, didn't like the idea that their teens were hanging around with a young teenager who was pregnant. The pastor said he was one of those teens, and he was sitting in the congregation one Sunday morning. Two of the mothers were sitting in front of him. And in walked this young teenage girl. She was getting pretty big, he said, by that time. Showing quite a bit. And as she walked in, the moms, one of them said to another, you know, in their sanctuary voice that's supposedly soft, but everybody can hear. The mom said, I can't believe she'd come here in that condition. In fact, I really don't know why she thinks she belongs. He said that's the last Sunday he remembered seeing her in church. He said it was several years later, about 20, <laughs> several, and this thing called Facebook had come into being. And he said, on Facebook, you know, you can become acquainted with people, with friends that maybe you knew in high school. And he said he became acquainted with this girl. He said he was looking over a Facebook point, uh, her Facebook post. And you know, on Facebook, there's this place where you can put in information. And in the information, you can give some things like what movies you like, what uh, books you like. You can also give some quotes that you like. And this lady had taken a quote from Gandhi that said this, I like your Christ, but I don't like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. And he thought, wow, how that must have affected her. Well, as I thought about that, I thought about the story in John's Gospel in its eighth chapter. For the story is about the woman caught in adultery. I don't know about you, I've always struggled with the fact that the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, they brought the woman, but they didn't bring the God. Yes. If I understand adultery right, it's a two-person act. And 
And scripture says in the Old Testament that both of them are to be stoned. But they only brought the woman. And they brought her to Jesus. And they forced her, if you would, to his feet. Well, let me, let me read the passage of Scripture. John's Gospel, the 8th chapter, beginning at verse 1. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him. And he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in an act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote it on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. I hope in our talking about following and fan, you picked up on this one thing that I want to say today. And I want to make sure I say it in context. Because just the statement by itself is kind of dangerous. But let me make a statement. Relationships are more important than rules. Now I'm not saying that rules are unimportant. God's Word gives us a lot of rules and guidelines. And can I tell you, they are for our good. They are for our benefit. But if we're not careful, we can make the rules what save us. We can make the rules what are most important. When what is most important is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Rules can be cumbersome. Rules can be misused. Pharisees were doing that. They'd taken the rules and they said, okay, we're going to use them to what? To trap Jesus. They didn't want to bring about salvation. They didn't want to bring about a right relationship with God. All they wanted to do was to use the rules to trap Jesus. Jesus didn't break the rule. He just put it in proper context. God doesn't give us rules to break us. They're given to us so that we might have a better relationship with Him. But if we're not careful, Rules can be cumbersome. Rules can be difficult. And if we begin to think that rules save us, we get in trouble. Let me give an example. I don't know, maybe somebody here grew up going to a Christian school or to a Catholic school. If you did, let me tell you, they had a lot of rules. They might have rules on how long your hair could be. Even for the guys. You know, if it touched the collar. Mm -mm. 
If you didn't wear nice slacks, no jeans, nice slacks, dress slacks, you had to go home and change. You had to have a button-down shirt, none of these pullover things that I like to wear. You know. And if you didn't follow the rules, and there were a lot of rules, if you didn't shave, in fact, <laughs> Kyle Eidelman talks about that. One time he was 13 years of age, he went to this Christian school that he was a part of, and he had to call his mom. Mom, can you come pick me up? I didn't shave this morning. And I have to shave, so can you come pick me up, let me shave, and bring me back to school? At 13, can you imagine that? <laughs> but sometimes we get caught in rules, and, and, and rules become what's most important. And can I tell you what has happened a lot of times to these kids who went to Christian schools and Catholic schools and schools like that. They went through high school, and the minute they got out of high school, they forgot about the church, they forgot about a relationship with Jesus Christ, and they just forgot about the whole spiritual thing because the rules, they thought, is what made them a Christian. Instead of a relationship with Jesus Christ. And they couldn't keep all the rules. They were too burdensome. There were too many. That's right. And they knew at one time or another, they'd miss it. You see, what I find out about rules is rules don't offer much grace. Rules are not grace. Jesus Christ is graceful. I've used the illustration before. I know Paul talks in Scripture about God being the judge and Jesus being our advocate, and he is. And we have often used the illustration of a courtroom. But you know, you can go into a courtroom, you can stand before the judge, and your advocate, your attorney, can defend you. You can be dismissed as far as not guilty, walk out of there free, never have a relationship with the judge. Can I tell you what I think Christianity should be more explained like? I think it's times it's sitting around a kitchen table. And God is the Father. And Jesus the Son is our older brother. And we've blown it. We've done something that we know is wrong, that breaks the family rules, that, you know, we just have really messed up. And we're sitting at this table, and Father's there, and our older brother's there, but our older brother starts defending us. And finally in the discussion, the Father says, Son, there's consequences, you're going to have to deal with them, but you're forgiven. And can I tell you, you still have a relationship with the Father. And you still have a relationship with the Son. But there's grace applied. And that grace flows in our hearts and in our lives. And God the Father and God the Son and the Holy Spirit want to have a relationship with us that is graceful. And if we start from grace, and if we know forgiveness, then you know what? The rules will come. We'll follow them. And let me give you another example. Becky's not here this morning, so I can talk about it. <laughs> When we got married, I knew that there were some rules that I was going to follow. Until death it was part. I'm going to be faithful. I committed to taking care of her. I committed to love her. With all my heart, soul, and life. I learned that after we were married, there were some other rules. <laughs> One of them is, I don't tickle her ears. Uh-uh. I 
also don't make fun of her before 10, 11 o'clock in the morning. Mm -mm, that just gets me in trouble. I also, guys, can you believe it? I have to listen to her when she talks. <laughs> those are some of the rules. Now, if I looked at those rules and all those rules, and I just took my relationship with her based on those rules, at times it could become a duty. At times it could become a hassle. At times I could just say, you know what? It's not worth it. But you know what? I have a relationship with Becky. I love her. Amen. And I know she loves me. Yeah. And because of that, I do the rules because I know it makes the relationship better. Right. But the rules aren't the beginning. The beginning is I have a relationship with her and we love one another. And because of that, I'm willing to keep those rules and do things like dishes now and then. Well, now because it's in the dishwasher, it's not quite so bad. Putting the toilet seat down. You know, so, so, some things that are really extravagant, you know, I, I'm willing to do. But it comes out of a relationship. I say all that because the woman here caught in adultery, she'd broken the rules, no doubt about it. She'd gotten caught. There's so many things in this story that bug me that just show the horribleness to me of the Pharisees. You know, how did they know this was going on? Was she set up? There's just so many things that just pop through my mind as I, as I think about this story. But the thing is, when she comes to Jesus, what the scribes and the Pharisees want, they want him to condemn her so they can put her to death and so that they can show that Jesus keeps the rules. Because the scribes and the Pharisees felt like they were the ones in charge of the rules. You see, rules don't save us. Relationships with Jesus does. And when they brought her to Jesus, and they said, what do we do with her, Jesus? What does Jesus do? He writes, kneels down, and writes in the sand. Everybody always wants to know what he wrote. I want to know what he wrote. Uh, I think it's interesting to think about. We don't know. I, I guess my favorite thing to think about is he began to write the sins of the people around. You never had enough sand for that. That might be, you're right. You may not have enough sand for that. But he started writing things that those around would look and think about. And when he said, okay, let you who are without sin cast the first stone. And I do like the part where it says, from the older they left. Because I think as we mature in our faith, hopefully we understand how much we need God's grace and how much we have been forgiven of and how much God has had to work in our lives and hopefully we're more merciful instead of more rule-keeping strict. Hopefully we're more grace. And I think as he wrote in the sand, as they read and realized their sins, what they did was they said, oh, I don't have a right to condemn. I don't have a right to judge. And so they left. And then Jesus applied the ultimate grace the one who could have condemned Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. But notice what he also says, because I don't want to overlook it. He says, go your way and quit your life of sin. 
He says, if you're going to have a relationship with me like it should be, you're going to have to stop sinning. And I can help you do that. But know when you mess up <laughs> that there is grace. And grace that is applied in our lives. Kyle Eidman tells a story about a young lady that came to church where he was pastoring. They had a visitor center. It was a large church. They had a visitor center, so they had greeters set up. Uh, this lady came into church probably about five minutes as church was about to start. She had a young child who was in elementary school with her. And the greeter that went up to her and greeted her said, hello, and it's nice to have you. She could tell the lady was very nervous. She'd never been to church for that before. So the greeter helped her take her child, was her son, to a classroom and get the son settled in. And then they went back to the foyer. So going back to the foyer, the greeter said to the lady, she said, would you like to sit in the sanctuary with me? And the lady's response was, can I go in the sanctuary? I'm not a member. Can I go into the sanctuary? And she said, the visitor, the lady said to her, six years ago, my husband divorced me. And the church I was going to wouldn't accept me after that. And I haven't been back to church since. The greeter said, I'm a single mom. I understand the difficulties of raising a child. I know what you're going through. You're welcome here. Come on and sit with me. They went into the sanctuary. They sat down. The service, as I said, was already going on. And they came to a point where they had a time of prayer. They got up and stood up to pray. As they prayed, the worship leader prayed something along the lines of, Lord, thank you for your presence. Thank you that you know our journey. Thank you that you love us no matter where we've been. And she said the tears of the visitor just started to flow and flow through the rest of the service. At the end of the service, the pastor made a call for those who wanted to know Jesus Christ. The visitor said, I'd like to go up front and make a call, make a commitment. They went up front and the pastor met the visitor. She said to the pastor, I'm a divorced mom. The church I was at wouldn't accept me. It kind of took the pastor back, stunned him. That's not how the body of Christ is supposed to act. And the pastor finally pulled himself together and said, you're welcome here. And she became a part of that church family. I say all of that to remind you of a couple of things this morning. The most important thing in being a fan or a follower is to make sure you're following Jesus Christ, that you have a personal relationship with Him. And then that we make sure that yes, though we have rules, and they are important. So we understand relationship is what's most important. And anybody's welcome to be a part of the body of Christ. God's working on us all in some part of our lives. Right. And what we need to remember is to be graceful to one another. And to accept one another. Through Christ's love. So that if the woman caught in adultery was brought into this church, 
we would say, hopefully, you're welcome here. For we have a Christ who transforms our lives. And all of us need that transformation. Amen. No matter whether it's male or female, no matter whether it's young or old, no matter the color of our skin, no matter whatever distinction you want to make, when it comes to the foot of the cross, we're all welcome. And if we're a follower of Christ, we know that. And we allow him to work through us to touch others and to help them follow. Amen. Yes. I'll ask you one more time this morning. Are you a fan or a follower? Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you know he's forgiven you of your sin? And do you have a relationship with him that is alive, vital, personal, growing, day in and day out? Or are you just a fan? You know about it. You know the Bible stories. You know what we're supposed to do in church. But you go through the motions and don't have the relationship. Is Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Are you a fan or a follower? Would you stand with me, please? Dear Heavenly Father,